Entendi. Right, I'll just quickly run through the notices, which hopefully you've either had a printed copy or an email. Um, but I'll just run through the things that are happening this week. So please note there's no prayer gathering on Zoom on Tuesday morning because uh, there'll be chaos, or hopefully organised chaos in the church hall when we host the primary sixes for Bubblegum and Fluff, which is telling the Christmas story without all the kind of trappings and other things, what Christmas is all about. And we have this opportunity, the primary sixes come down for the morning, so I'm afraid uh, the prayer meeting will not happen on uh, Tuesday, but there will be prayer meeting as usual uh, in the warmth of the session room uh, on Thursday morning at quarter to nine. On Tuesday morning, if you're not involved with bubblegum and fluff, you could go to the Priory for coffee at 11 o'clock. They have this weekly coffee and chat. Busy Bees will be on on Wednesday and Friday morning, but not Wednesday afternoon. It is on Wednesday afternoon. The notices were wrong. Okay. It's a Christmas party. Okay, so if you know young families, uh, under school age children come to Busy Bees on Wednesday. Uh, on Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock in St. Ebba's Church, there's the Advent churches together, the East Berwickshire churches together, Advent gathering for an hour. Thursday, the vestry hour, um, Andy and Jellius will be at the front door of the church at 10.30. And then on Friday evening, there's a quiz night in the church hall. Come along, you can have a team of up to four people, uh, 10 pounds a team, and there'll be tea and coffee and a tuck shop available. And then next Sunday evening, East Berwickshire Churches Together host the Carols by Candlelight in the Priory, and that's at seven o'clock. Uh, so do come along, that's always a, a good evening. There's other Christmas notices and things, but hopefully you'll either have a printed copy, and if not, there are still some available on the way out, or by email. The only other thing I've got to ask you is that there's been a request for a sort of carols and uh, readings service sometime in the week leading up to Christmas and Andy doesn't want to stand here by himself so he'd like to know which day and time would best suit people so can I have a show of hands is it still Margaret Thursday is no good okay No, it was going to be at 4 or 4.30. So, can we see, if people are interested, would you like to come on the Wednesday? If you think the Wednesday, it would be Wednesday or Thursday before Christmas. For those who would like to come on the Wednesday, can I see a show of hands? Thursday? There's, okay, that's fine. I mean, Andy's, Andy's got better things to do than have a service if people are not wanting to have a service. So that's fine, because there is the carols next Sunday evening in the Priory. Okay, thank you for showing us, because that's, that's what's important. Now, just before we start our service, to show the importance of the Bible as part of our worship, could the Bible stand for the Bible to come in? like to sit. So let us just take a few moments of silence to prepare our hearts to worship the living God.
And now can we read together? The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. So can we join together to sing joy to the world? As you all know, this is the third Sunday of Advent, and we've been looking at the last two Sundays, and there was peace, and then there was the love of Jesus, and today it's the joy that Jesus gives. And I'm just saying to those who'd get the uh, upper room, I've taken today's reading from it, but I'm sure you'll not mind reading it again if you've already read it. The man who wrote it was called Adam. When I visited New York City during the holiday season, I stopped by the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center. It was over 70 feet tall and looked spectacular with thousands of lights and a bright star on top. I was delighted when I heard all the families, the children's, grands, grandpas, the young people, all excited and full of joy at the wonder of all that was going on in that square. And I know sometimes that we're like that if some people may be gone to Germany to see the markets there, or other peoples have gone up to Edinburgh, or even down in a town when it's Christmas shopping. We all talk to each other, don't we? And we say to them, oh, how are you doing? Things that probably when we're rushing about during the day, we don't say our heads are down and we're busy. Now, Christmas time is a wonderful time. And Adam, he says, Aaron says, I enjoy it every year. But if I didn't know the true meaning of Christmas, my joy would be as temporary as the trees displayed each year at Rockefeller Center. When the holiday season is over, 
The, God, the tree gets put away, doesn't it? The lights are packed away for another day. Uh, and we begin to think, what can I do next for my joy? And we know in January that folks buy holidays and things like that to cheer them up for the coming. We're always looking for something else to bring us joy. But, you know, uh, Adam says, my happiness during the holiday season is fleeting, but my joy is in Jesus eternal. The story of Christmas is one of salvation and redemption. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into the world to redeem us and to restore our relationship with God. And that story keeps me awestruck all year long. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, and for our everlasting joy in him. We can find joy in Jesus all year long. Now I'm going to ask Aidan and Isla and Mon Asha to come up and they're going to light the candles. And now we'll have a prayer, so let us pray. And just at the end, we will say the Lord's Prayer. Feel free to use the words that you are familiar with. So let us pray. Thank you, God, that we are able to come here today to worship and praise you when so many around the world cannot do this for fear of persecution and torture and death. Please help us to really focus on the name of Jesus for the next hour. And we pray that we will know your presence amongst us during this service. But, merciful God, we come confessing our sins and shortcomings. Though we try to put the past behind us, all too often we are haunted by mistakes. Though we try to make amends for the wrongs we have done, we find it hard to escape a sense of guilt. Often, we ask you for forgiveness, but find it hard to forgive those who treat us badly. Remind us that you are always ready to offer free and total forgiveness. Forgive us for the times we have marred your image within us. We are sorry for when we have made assumptions about people different from ourselves and excluded those who Jesus went out of his way to include. Help us to accept your forgiveness and to forgive others. Receive then our thanks and lead us forward, granting us grace to worship you aright. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen.
And now our next hymn will be While Humble Shepherds Watch Their Flocks. So I invite you to stand. The reading this morning is from James chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. Patience in suffering. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. And now we'll have a small reflection on that reading from James chapter 5. As we read this passage and note James's call to patience, we're reminded that this is Advent and Christians wait for Christmas. And patience can be a difficult virtue to practice at this time. We are lighting the Advent candles and unconsciously we count the weeks and perhaps days till Christmas. James, however, was not calling his audience to wait patiently for the birth of Christ. It was instead about the coming of the Lord. James was writing writing to Jewish Christians who were struggling with many temptations and whom James feared were likely to abandon their faith. He wanted them to know that it was in being patient and conscious of the imminent return of the Lord 
that their faith would be strengthened. He likened the length of waiting to the unpredictable wait of the farmer who waits for the precious crop from the earth. The farmer is simply rewarded with a harvest uh, after a long wait. So believers who serve the Lord must wait for the Lord's return. James is pointing out to believers, to Jesus as their strength in difficulties. In Jesus, all expectations find fulfillment. And as Christians, we are encouraged to wait for God's response as our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Um, during the 1980s, for three Christmases in succession, um, I went with my teen then teenage children skiing uh, in, Austri in, in the Alps, Austria or Switzerland. And each Christmas Eve, we went to the midnight service in the village church. And it was magical, trudging through the snow, through the churchyard where in the Alpine tradition, there is a candlelit lantern on every gravestone in their churchyard as you walk through. And every year I was reminded of the story about Stille Nacht. Um, back in, it was Christmas Eve 1818, that the young parish priest in a little village up in the mountains, not far from Salzburg, um, at o Ovendorf, he discovered that the organ was out of action. Mice had got into it. They'd obviously chewed the leather inside and the bellows didn't work. Now the priest had already written a poem for Christmas, which he called Stille Nacht, and he asked his organist if he could supply music so that they could sing it that night. So on the 25th, or the 29th, 24th of December, 1818, the um, Still a Nacht was sung first, accompanied by a guitar. So today, you are going to reenact that first performance of Still a Nacht with Dixie providing the accompaniment. And you're going to sing the first verse in German. First. You've put it up, good. Now, German's quite an easy language because you say what you see. The only thing is, unlike us, they don't have a silent K. So you pronounce the K at the beginning of Kanaba. And the only other one is, in German, there is no W. Or at least, uh, there's no V, sorry. They pronounce W as a V. So in the second line, it's Wacht. So it's Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, alles schläft, einsam wacht. Nur das Traute hoch heidige Paar, holde Knabe in lockigen Haar, schlaf in himmlische Ruhe, schlaf in himmlische Ruhe. And in true Lutheran fashion, as they have there, you remain seated. So sitting, singing in German for the first verse, and then you can have it in English after that. Um, com accompanied by a thing. So we're reenacting the first performance, and you're getting a free lesson in German at the same time.
The second reading is from Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 2. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we look for another? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of, of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about, about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed in the wind? If not, what did you go to see? A man dressed in fine clothes. No. Those who wear fine clothes are kings in palaces. Then what did you go out to see? Persistent. A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it's written. I will send my messenger ahead of you. When will prepare, sorry, do it again. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare you, your way, before you. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. You, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. Amen.
This reflection is from Matthew 11, verses 2 to 11. John the Baptist had been challenging people to live according to God's laws. He was not afraid to challenge religious and political leaders. And after challenging Herod, he was arrested. In this passage, we are told that news of Jesus' flourishing ministry reaches John in prison. As John the Baptist waits in prison, he begins to ponder his fate, to examine his life, and wonder if he was right about Jesus. He boldly sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus is not upset or dismissive, but instead points John's messengers to the miracles that had been performed. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. In effect, Jesus reminds the messengers and the crowd that Jesus is indeed the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies of the Messiah, who responds to the news of the people. Very few Christians would say they have never had doubts about life or about their faith. This passage raises the questions of how we might deal with doubts when it concerns our faith. Perhaps we need to share our doubts with fellow Christians who can help us look again at Jesus, who he is, and how he has shown his love for us. We may, pond, we may wonder why prayers don't seem answered. We may never understand why Jesus says or does nothing. This happened to John the Baptist, first when he was arrested, and then when he was beheaded. What we see is Jesus affirming the role that John the Baptist played in the fulfillment of the messianic ministry. Jesus knows how we are seeking to follow and serve him and one day will acknowledge it. <clears throat> We're now going to have our nativity play, so if I get all the kids to go over that side, and then you'll be ready. Now, we're doing panto nativity today, which means that you guys all need to take part as well. So I've got some signs, so when I lift them up, you have to shout, uh, well, there's an applause at the very beginning, um, which I'll hang up. Um, you've also got, when Mary and Joseph appear, they are the heroes of this pantomime nativity today. So when Mary and Joseph appear, you have to go, hooray! When King Herod comes on, he's the villain, because he was a baddie, and you have to shout, boo, hiss. And then there'll be an opportunity to shout, bah, as well and have your good angelic voices with singing your hallelujahs as well and this so without further ado i will hand over to our young people who are going to take the next part of this a while back god made the world he made day and night, he made land and sea, he made plants and trees. He made animals to live on the land, in the water and in the sky, and he made man and woman to be his friends. Then God had a sit down and a cup of tea and chatted with the angels about how good it all looked. Now, God isn't constrained by the same time frame as we are. He knows how the story is going to turn out from the very beginning. So he wasn't surprised when the people he created decided to try and live their lives however they wanted instead of following God's ways. But he was very sad about it as he knew that it would mean they would miss out on his best hopes and dreams for them. That's why God had already thought of a method to enable people to come back to living life his way. Yes. God had a cunning plan. 
He would send his son Jesus to live on the earth as a man to tell people how to get back to being best friends with God and to make it possible by being a sacrifice to pay the price for all the things they'd done wrong. Now, how should God get Jesus from heaven and onto the earth? Hmm, perhaps not. And suddenly the shopkeeper appeared. Hmm, perhaps not that way either. And so it came to pass that the Virgin Mary was with child through the Holy Spirit. An angel appeared to Joseph. An angel appeared to Joseph, Mary's husband, in a dream, and told them to name the baby Jesus, which means the Lord saves. Mary and Joseph Hooray! are the heroes in this story. They were very brave and did everything God asked them to. Everyone knows the next bit. Caesar Augustus ordered the census, so Mary and Joseph... had to make their way to Bethlehem to register. The town was packed and there was really no room at the end, so when Mary gave birth, they placed the baby Jesus in a manger. Isn't that lovely? An angel appeared to some shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And said loudly, Your saviour has been born. Go and see him lying in a manger. He was then joined by a whole choir of angels singing... What a beautiful sound. And after this recitation, the shepherds scurried off and found Mary and Joseph. And the baby in the manger, just as they had been told. On their way home, they told lots of other people. Some wise men from the east also came to visit baby Jesus.
They travelled to Jerusalem and stopped in to ask King Herod. If he knew where the king of the Jews had been born. King Herod. Is the bad guy in this story. He didn't know the answer to their question and had to ask the chief priests and teachers of the law. And so King Herod. And the wise men found out that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. A star guided the wise men the rest of the way. And when they saw Jesus, they presented him with gifts and worshipped him. King Herod had asked the wise men to come back and tell him exact, exactly where Jesus could be found, so that he could go and worship him too. But they were warned in a dream not to do this, and went home a different way. King Herod didn't really want to worship Jesus at all. He was jealous and frightened at the prospect of a rival king, and wanted Jesus dead. So Mary and Joseph Yay! took baby Jesus and went and hid in Egypt. Some years later, when it was safe, they moved back to Nazareth in Israel. And that's the story how God of God, how God chose to send his son to earth in preparation for the job of reconciliation he was to carry out. And it was all made possible by the willing cooperation of Mary and Joseph. Yay! The end. Can we bring forward the offering, please?
Thank you, Lord, for your church. And may we continue to support and praise you within its walls. We offer up our offering to your gracious works. Amen. Dear Lord, in this time of Advent, we pray for those people caught up in war, famine, drought, and illness. Be with them, Lord. We can plan for the celebration of the birth of Jesus, but many have to keep their faith under cover, and to worship you open, openly will bring persecution to their families. Be with them, Lord. We pray for families affected by the steep rise in the cost of living. We thank you for all the organizations who look after each other and keep your commandments of loving God and loving our neighbors. Be with them, Lord. Be with the families that have lost someone and feel that Christmas will not be the same without those that they have loved so much. Be with us all, Lord, so that we can carry on doing the things that matter in our community. Above all, we give thanks for this precious gift of the love that you give so freely. Thank you for answering the prayers that we give to you and always being there in our lives and in our hearts. Be with us, Lord. Amen. And now we will have, O oh, come all ye faithful, but we'll admit verse 4. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone who's taken part in the service this morning, and special thank you to Carrie and the children for the Nativity that has reminded us that we are focusing our eyes on Jesus. But as our readings also reminded us, we can have doubts, but keep looking back to Jesus. And the other thing 
is we need patience. We need to keep on waiting, keep our focus on Jesus. And so let us say together, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And please do come through to the hall and have a cup of tea and coffee. You don't need to go outside, you can just go through this way if you'd like.